the cool thing about potholes is that it just looks like some dirt in a hole in the rock and you add water and you come back the next day and there are all these things swimming around in there. They are ephemeral, they are temporary, but they're teeming with life. This is a nice little cluster here. We, um, we're doing some comparative studies. You see really um, similar potholes, very close together, but the communities are really different. Potholes are basins in the rock. They're erosional features. They're dry most of the time, but when it rains, then they fill up with water. And people don't realize it, but even when they're dry, there are living organisms in that basin. So these little depressions that have discoloration are active ecosystems, even though they don't look like much. So we're gonna see if this one happens to have the little bitty mite that is found only on the Colorado Plateau. The little Paraquanathus grammi. Yep, um, they're already starting to move just in that, that few seconds since I poured the water in. You can see them coming to life. So within seconds, after the pool gets wet, the mites will start moving around crawl around in there and forage on the nematodes and rotifers and tardigrades. There are a lot of species in the potholes, but the crustaceans are really my favorite. So this group, fairy shrimp, tadpole shrimp, and clam shrimp are in a group called the branchiapoda branch. That means gill and poda and pod, that stands for foot. And so they actually have their gills that they breathe and acquire oxygen are on their legs, so they have gill feet. And the, the fairy shrimp are really neat because they're very numerous, very abundant, and you can have thousands in a pool. And they, they move around, not necessarily in concert, but they do kind of follow the same path. So it's sort of like this huge ballet troupe that's swimming around in the water. And they swim upside down, so you can see all of their legs. They'll have 20, 30 pairs of legs. They're filtering the water, getting algae and organic material out of the water to feed on. They'll swim down to the bottom and they'll flip over so they're right side up and they'll stir that sediment up and they pick the particles up in their legs. When you're watching the fairy shrimp swim around, you can tell the females pretty easily because they have an egg sac. The males and the females mate, but it's a very quick operation. The males have grasping antenna and they swim up behind the female, grab onto her, and it's just a couple of seconds of reproductive activity and then they break apart. We got tadpoles and tadpole shrimp, fairy shrimp, clam shrimp. Um, you can see dragonflies flying around and damselflies. Looks like we have a lot of Streptocephalus uh, texanus, the large fairy shrimp with the orange telson. And then you have clam shrimp, which are, like the name says, sort of clam shaped. They have a, a carapace that is bivalve. It's hinged and so they can close up like a clam shell. And a lot of the clam shrimp do have egg sacs. And uh, we've got both species, the Eulimnadia and Leptotheria in here. One has a white egg sac. They both have kind of saddlebags across the middle of their carapace. And one's orange and one's white. There's some little ostracods in here too, the little seed shrimp. They're shaped like the clam shrimp, but they're actually not very closely related to the clam shrimp. And then the tadpole shrimp, they're the biggest shrimp in the pool. And they're kind of a vacuum cleaner along the sediment. They do come up into the water column sometimes, so they'll feed on fairy shrimp. This pool is in a drainage. Um, I refer to these as tanahas or tanks. When you get um, a lot of rain like we've had recently, um, then you'll get the, the insects like the diving beetles, water boatmen and back swimmers, and they're really voracious predators and they can clean out the crustaceans. Um, down here on the, on the bottom of the pool, there's a 
diving beetle larva actually has six long legs and uh, and they'll grow up to be um, a, kind of a regular looking beetle but the adult also lives in the water and these guys are are quite voracious and if you look at a close-up of them they've got some really big pincher jaws these insects are almost all predators it's pretty amazing the organisms that they'll tackle like the diving beetle larva there they'll grab a prey like a clam shrimp they'll come up into the water column even and grab it and then drag it down to the bottom and crawl around while they're sucking the body of the clam shrimp they inject enzymes into the body and digest the nutrients and then they suck them back out The landscape we're standing on in the Colorado Plateau here, the river came through about five million years ago. And so sometime in that time frame, the tadpole shrimp and fairy shrimp eggs blew into these basins and colonized these potholes. Whenever that basin eroded, then um, once the eggs get into that system, then that lineage is in the pool for thousands of years. They are living fossils. The species that lives out here is very similar to a species that has been found in fossils in the rock. There's not a lot of evolution going on, but they certainly are successful. Aquatic insects will occasionally colonize these temporary pools. And so, so they'll come in, they'll lay their eggs, and then the adults will fly away. And that's important because the adults can fly. So they can escape that temporary pothole but the shrimp are aquatic, period. And so how do they survive that dry period? Well, it turns out that there are actually three strategies for living in a pothole. And we've talked about the first one, that's escape. There are a few organisms that use what I call the Tupperware strategy, and they stay wet when the pool dries out. They go down into the sediment and they seal up their bodies so that they can stay wet. And then when it rains again, they're ready to go within seconds, really. And then the third strategy is what the shrimp use, and they lay eggs that are capable of staying alive when they lose almost all of the water in the egg. And they can lose up to 92%, and then when you add water back in, they hatch out and are ready to go. In that dormant, dehydrated state, they are incredibly resistant to other environmental stresses. They can withstand very high temperatures, very cold temperatures. They've been taken out into space, and this is one of the really cool things about them, is that they have taken their eggs outside the spacecraft into the vacuum of space, the full ionizing radiation of the sun, brought them back into the spacecraft, back down to Earth, put them in water, and they hatch. You know, we all say, don't put all your eggs in one basket. But these shrimp, they're stuck in that one basket. They watch that basket by producing eggs that hatch under different conditions. Then even the same clutch will hatch under different conditions. So we talk about conserving organisms, animals and plants, ecosystems. And, you know, some people think, well, What's a, what's a juniper tree worth or what's a tadpole shrimp worth? But um, in large part, we don't really know. But everything's connected. The ecosystem is a web. And if you pull on one string, then you're going to affect the other parts. If you don't have all the parts, then the ecosystem doesn't function. And we are reliant upon the processes that go on in those ecosystems, even if we don't really realize it. If we don't take care of it, then we won't be able to inhabit it. Those organisms, they have some secrets that we can now take advantage of. The strategies that they use, like the eggs, how those eggs survive, um, they use uh, sugar to stabilize the proteins in the egg, and then it dries out, and so they can tolerate that drying. And we take that same process and apply it to things like antibiotics. You can dry it out and you have these boxes in a warehouse, doesn't matter how hot they get, doesn't matter how cold they get. When you need them, you add water and they work. And, and we get those things because evolution has worked out those mechanisms with other organisms and we can take advantage of it. 
For ecosystems like the potholes, those organisms are stuck in that system. That population is dependent on the sediment staying in the pothole. But if you walk in there when it's dry, the next wind can move a lot of those eggs out of the system and the chances are they're not gonna fall in another pothole. So if you see a depression in the rock, whether it's wet or dry, there are living organisms there. And so it's best to walk around it, don't walk through it. People, I don't know that if they recognize that these basins are ecosystems. When they're wet, then you should look at them. They're, um, get down on there. I, I talk about belly animals that I study and, and lay down on your belly and watch the, the critters in the, in the potholes. They are really fascinating to watch. They're unusual. They're not things that you see just anywhere. So check them out.